Hey guys, and welcome to a quick reaction video. Um, <laughs> as soon as I uploaded FNAF Unsolved, um, just now, uh, this came out. Uh, it's a game theory episode on FNAF. I didn't know it would come out at all, and I'm super excited. Um, if you didn't know, I have theorised a lot over the past few years about FNAF, and hopefully Matt will be along the right lines on this one. I know he did a timeline that I didn't fully agree with, but um, this just came out, so I'm going to react to it, <sighs> see how accurate he is. Let's go. I think it's about a new book, but I've ne I haven't read it. <laughs> Game series. Book series. Help wanted. New book series. Oh, come on. A fine. Phone guy. Phone dude. Purple guy. Orange dude. D didn't you just... Urgh, fine. Wild card. Change the category to timeline. <laughs> Bite of 87. Chomp of 83. Party of 85. Wait, but... Time traveling ball pit. <laughs> yeah, um... Scott really likes to do that. He just like... Oh, you thought it was this? Well, actually, I'm gonna just change it up a little bit. I need to shut up my Discord. Scott does that a lot. He he makes up new new plots so that we get even more confused when we solve something. Um, I love this. This is very accurate. You can't just reverse. Oh yeah, reverse. 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 reverse, 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 reverse. reverse. <laughs> Internet, welcome to Game Theory. Another day, another installment in the FNAF multimedia conglomerate. So, at this point, some people in the FNAF community really hate my gut. I really respect Matt. Um, I he I know his team, he, he, him and his team put in a lot of work uh, into making these theories, and they are great. Um, but a lot of the time, uh, there's always room for error, and there's always room for improvement. Uh, and sometimes he's a little bit off with his theories, I, I, I feel. Um, it doesn't mean he's stupid, though. O obviously, if I'm dissing any of his theory here, it's not because he's. I think he's an idiot. Uh, he clearly isn't. He's clearly a very smart man. <laughs> but um, sometimes you can go a little bit wrong, um, and I might think of something over the top of him that will prove it wrong. I don't think I will though, because it is about something that I don't know about, <laughs> which is the new book, but let's go. I don't know if you can tell, but I really do like this franchise, and I see my role in it as a person just connecting ideas or presenting new threads to consider in a franchise that at this point is massive and really, really confusing. It's but true. this comment does bring up something that I should probably address at the top of this episode, since it'll this is something that both sides could use as a reminder, both my FNAF theory followers and my FNAF theory haters. There is a difference between canonicity and continuity, and I think a lot of the times in these sorts of discussions, they get confused with each other. Something yeah, being listed I agree. as canon oh, no, I get the same just thing means sometimes. that it's official. It is blessed by the person who is overseeing the rules of the universe. It is self-consistent within the boundaries of that fictional world. On the other hand, a continuity, at least as I'm referring to it here, is a timeline of events, a continuous story thread where one event leads to the next that leads to the next. Take Star Wars as an example. Rey having magic healing powers I've never watched Star Wars. <laughs> if force healing is in fact a thing, then why hasn't it been used to save literally anyone before this point in the series? Yeah, okay, no, it would I have been it really handy for old Qui-Gon Jinn over there in episode the one, but the fact remains, healing is now a canonical force power, which means that the canonicity of certain powers is presenting challenges to the established continuity of events that came before. Now, this is where FNAF comes in. You see, you can have multiple continuities all existing under the same canon. And it appears as though this yeah, is how yeah, the FNAF yeah. franchise is working. The original novels and the original games exist in an alternate universe from one another. They are separate continuities. And this and is yet, one of the problems I have with with comments I used to get a lot on my channel. Um, and that's the fact that, oh, you, you can't draw connections between the books and the games because they're completely different. They're not. They're separate universes, but they kind of tell the same story. Um, and, I mean, I wish, I really wish Scott could clarify it a bit more, but um, there are different continuities in the same canon, so that's him talking about the difference there. I like how he put that in because a lot of people always tell me, oh, you can't draw this reference because it's a completely different universe 
these are two different canons. No, they're not. They're two different continuities. This was all expressly stated by Scott years ago. Quote, so yes, the book is canon, just as the games are. That doesn't mean that they are intended to fit together like two puzzle yeah, pieces. No, exactly. The book is a reimagining of the Five Nights at Freddy's story, and if you go into it with that mindset, I think you'll really enjoy it. End quote. Now, what I've been trying to do with my theories, and what I think some people on both sides misunderstand, is that I'm not trying to use the books to solve a continuity. I'm trying to use the books to establish a canon that will then allow us to solve a continuity. The books present... Yes. Yeah, I know that is a good... a good point there as well, Matt. Are there any characters in the games who this may or may not apply to? I don't know, but it's a question that we owe it to ourselves to ask because it's been established to be canon within this franchise. Exactly. Exactly. You can't draw direct parallels between the books and the games, but um, if something is possible in the books, it's probably possible in the games. Um, a big, big possibility. Um, and so that's how you can kind of take information from the books and kind of apply it to the, the games. It's less of, I'll take this information from the books and put it into the games into the game's lore. That, it's not that, it's more, okay, I'll take these concepts from the books and I'll question the games. Could some of these things kind of just explain other things that's going on in the in the games? If not, then okay, fine. We'll try and look for other solutions. So I think it's more just questioning rather than let's get this information from here and put it into here. Um, and yeah, people get confused with that too. Do we know what these little pins are on Baby's design here in the game? No, no idea. In fact, most people probably didn't even remember that they existed in the first place. But in the books, they play an important role. These are the things that allow Baby to transform into a human disguise. Now, is that necessarily yes. what they're doing in the game? No, definitely not. That's is a the best very good example. the only clue for what they really are coming from a separate continuity? Yeah, in this case, yes it is. Scott recently made a new post about all of this to clarify the situation. In response to the question of whether the lore of FNAF is solvable, he said this, all I can do is say that some questions will be answered, even if it may not always be the answer you wanted. Be patient. Let me at least say this, future games will look forward, but look to the novels to fill in some of the blanks to the past. Okay, so there you have it. So that's confirmed by Scott, basically, including the books in our which, is, which is very good, because a little bit of clarification. Sure, remember what franchise we're talking about here, friend. Back when we only had the games, we did it with the number of Foxy Toads and Freddy Buttons. Did a missing button mean it was a new animatronic? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Now, we just have to do it with time-traveling ball pits and sound illusion discs. Oh my and god, it's crazy how f the FNAF franchise has, has evolved isn't it? It used to be just like um, pizzerias uh, and then FNAF 4 came out and it was apparently all a dream. Then FNAF 5 came out, or Sister Location, and suddenly everything's gone very robotic and strange. It's not just a pizzeria game anymore where you turn on flashlights and shut doors. FNAF 6 came out and it was like, okay actually let's just, let's just go back. Let, let, let's take a step back. Then VR came out, oh no, Ultimate Custom Light came out, which was cool. VR came out and everything, my mind just exploded. <laughs> that's, that's where I drew the line and kind of wanted to go back in FNAF theories because I don't know what's going on in FNAF VR anymore. Um, but yeah, he makes a really good point here. Last thing I'm gonna say on the issue, and hopefully it's the last time that I have to talk about it. At this point, where there's soon to be more books than there are games in this Is that how many books there are? What's that? It's eleven. That's eleven books. <laughs> that is crazy. There's more books than games. I mean, you'd expect that, right? You'd expect books to be coming out more than games, but that's crazy. I love how Scott randomly comes out with five Frasbear Frights. That's crazy. Uh, I do need to read the first two. I do need to read them. I might do that for you guys. If you want, if you guys want that, then tell me. Story number one, Fetch. Greg and his two friends, Haiti, Hattie, Haiti, and Cyril live near Olympia, Washington. Greg feels compelled to explore an old abandoned Freddy's restaurant where he discovers Fetch, a fearsome animatronic dog with sharp teeth and an even sharper understanding of texting lingo. Quote, how long has this place been empty? Greg asked. Fetch looks like he's older than my dad, but smartphones haven't been around that long. End quote. After getting scared huh, out of the okay. pizzeria, the dog goes on to fetch whatever Greg wants with increasingly disastrous results, killing a dog, ripping his uncle's finger off, and eventually 
eventually retrieving his school crush in the worst way possible. It's actually a pretty simple story, but there are two big things to call out about it. First, it continues a theme that we're starting to see develop in these books. Kids are being drawn to these restaurants. It's never explained in yeah. the story, but Greg yeah. feels compelled to go to Freddy's by some unseen force. Quote from the book, this might be what he'd felt in the field. What had called him here? And again, a bit later, it really does feel spooky in the fact that not have gotten what he was there for. These had kids are being pulled into the beat it, it, it kind and of ups Greg the spookiness. Is now the second <laughs> character to have some sort of psychic connection to these restaurants. As I talked about in our last theory, Oswald from Into the Pit had the exact same thing, where he inexplicably found himself drawing horrific animatronic monsters without ever knowing about Freddy's to begin with. It's also worth noting yeah, that both yeah. are the first stories in their respective books. It'll be interesting to see whether this trend holds in future installments. The second Ooh, important part of that, that's a good theory. Maybe the first story in each of the books, because there's five right now, maybe they all inter intertwine. Maybe it's even got something to do with the missing children, because there's five books. No idea. That's just a th theory out there, but I don't think it is. Oh, no, it isn't, because the first character is called Oswald. Um, but that that's a good thing to think about. Maybe they are connected some psychedelic way to these pizzerias. Um, someone's called them. don't know. It's, it's very strange to think about. Story number two, we'll come back to it in a minute, as that one has the most to discuss. Story number three, out of stock. A new plush trap toy, the plush trap chaser, a light activated chomping green rabbit is all the rage, selling out at stores across the nation. It also retails for $79.99. <laughs> so Scott be making those fat stacks both IRL okay. and in the book world for his killer merch. A boy named Oscar, fed up with never getting what he wants, shoplifts the last one, one that someone had supposedly returned for being defective. Quote, um, is it just me or That's does it creepy. look wrong? Isaac pointed at the straight, slightly yellow, human-looking oh, teeth that no. were visible through Plush Trap's partly opened mouth. And what's with the eyes? He reached out and poked one of the cloudy green eyes. Ew. He whipped his hand back and flicked his finger. Squishy. End quote. After a few days of oh, doing I just nothing, got chills. <laughs> Plush Trap suddenly activates and terrorizes Oscar and his friends, chomping through the house's doors and garages just trying to bite I them. I need to Their read these. Their only protection is that Plush Trap freezes in the light. Quote again, he was turning the box over and over in his hands, and there in bold letters was a critical detail. Walks in the dark, freezes in the light. End quote. A few hours so just and a comedic number of faulty <laughs> flashlights later, the boys destroy the monster at last by luring it in front of an oncoming train. A few things to call out here in this story. First and most obviously, it explains Plush Trap's behavior in FNAF 4. Yes! He really is yes. just a haunted toy that goes on a rampage and is stopped by the power of flashlights. He doesn't have human-like teeth though. I wonder if that's... That is an odd detail. Because there's not someone in it, is there? Like a baby. Oh god. I don't want to think too too deeply about that, but that is that is a strange thing to point out. And yeah, you're right. That is um, how he works in in FNAF 4. Huh. So it's cool to make that lore connection with Plush Trap's original mini game. We also know, based on the story, that Plush Trap apparently has the ability to mimic voices. He has a speaker system built in under his fur and is able to mimic the voices of Oscar's mother and friends. Now, this is a really interesting detail because up until this point, the only voice mimics in the franchise have been the fun time. I was about to say, it's like the fun time electronics, they have the little to lure children thing, away from the their parents so that they could be grabbed. This suggests the possibility that Plush Trap was either a prototype for those larger models testing out the voice mimicry software, or was himself a Funtime era animatronic. Whereas up until this point, all us theorists Maybe. have classified him alongside the other nightmares. He does have kind of a similar design to Bon Bon, but at the same time, as he's just pointed out there in the screenshot that I can see right now, um, it, it's a very nightmarish look as well. So. Firstly, it could be um, a reference to the fact that the FNAF 4 animatronics are made by actual real animatronics. Um, and secondly, that, yeah, yeah, it was a sister location prototype, and some of these animatronics do have those little discs in them that make you see different things, um, and also voice mimics um, and luring devices, of course. Um, it kind of further strengthens that theory. 
So good. All of these, all of these different theories are kind of getting a bit more light added to them, if you will. It's from Pnaf 4. But the last and most important thing to call out, though, is the fusion of human parts and animatronic parts. The whole okay. story makes it very clear that the plush trap Oscar runs away with has both human eyes and teeth. Quote from the book. Raj turned to Oscar. You managed to steal us the only plush trap chaser that looks like a half-human hybrid. And oh. Now, this idea of a half-robot, half-human animatronic is a completely new concept for the series. But is it? You see, in FNAF 4, no. we had ourselves Nightmare. The black, transparent, spooky bear that, if you looked closely enough, had a human brain in its head as a part of its design. Wait, really? A detail that pretty much all of us... Oh, he does as well. Huh. Uh, no, I was thinking more uh, Michael. Uh, the fact that he he is like half, although that was kind of, mm, yeah. I was thinking how Michael was like rotting. He was half human, half ended basically. Um, but Nightmare has a brain. Hmm. <laughs> dismissed. I mean, all of us glossed over Nightmare in general as just like the embodiment of death. The game's grim reaper as the crying child slowly yeah. flatlines in his hospital bed. Or, you know, just a figment of the boy's haunted imagination. But with this context from Fazbear Fright, could Nightmare have actually been a real experiment? Was William Afton in his quest yeah. for immortality, no, or Henry in his quest for more lifelike robots, testing the human brain's ability to survive in and operate an animatronic body? Uh, Ah, see, that's where um, I Can Put You Back Together comes back in. Because I've always gone with the theory that William, um, at, after the bite of 83, where supposedly Michael, I, I'm not going to go into that, uh, where William's child um, gets bitten and gets sent to hospital, um, essentially William is trying to put him back together with the missing children. I know that seems like a stretch, I have evidence for it though, um, but also I think the fact that he was testing human, humanoid robots and stuff to make things more realistic um, is, is a good point too, and I think that's where Remnant came in as well. I think maybe he tried the brain, maybe he tried a heart and stuff, none of it worked. It had to be the soul that powered these robots, and that's how the origin of all this stuff came about. Possibly. <laughs> Would make Nightmare the literal Frankenstein's monster for family entertainment dining. <laughs> Even though I say that jokingly, it's also something that appears in the Curse of Dreadbear DLC for FNAF. Oh, that is true. We actively program a brain yeah. and insert it into Dreadbear's head before Hand Unit tells us. This. Oh, I didn't think about that. Well done. It's time to introduce the creature to the kids for focus testing and troubleshooting. We know, based on the original trilogy of books, that Afton was obsessed with recreating living metal just like those original haunted animatronics. I see Nightmare, Dreadbear, and this plush trap all as potential experiments looking to do exactly that. Lastly, we come to story number two. Dreadbear, only definitely. Friends, my personal favorite of the bunch. In this one, we have rebellious teen Alec looking to expose his goody two-shoe sister Hazel for the the fraud that she really is. Alec, in this story, is actually a really tragic character. He's a teen who acts out because he's ignored by his parents. And the main reason cool. he's trying to bring down his sister is because she is always the one who gets the attention. The two of them inexplicably team up to torment their parents in the lead up to Hazel's birthday party at Freddy Fazbear's, with Alec planning on double crossing her on Fazbear's. the day of the party. When the day arrives, Alec's plan backfires. It's revealed that Hazel is truly just that pure and good of a person. It's been Alec who's been the jerk pushing every everyone around him away, thinking himself as the victim when he was actually making himself into the victim. Ah. With the parents just trying to cater to his needs and Hazel just wanting a brother who liked her, Alec runs off, ashamed of his actions and hides in the storage closet. Just as he starts to make a promise to change for the better, he meets with a short little lonely Freddy free-roaming two-foot doll made to entertain kids that are ignored or forgotten about at parties. But things are never quite what they seem in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The cute little bear hypnotizes Alec and then body swaps with him, imprisoning God's Alec's sake. consciousness inside the tiny bear body. Quote from that moment, there, sitting across the table from his- My first reaction to that is, that's crazy, um, so many new concepts are being added to FNAF that I don't like. Um, but the other thing that I, I think is, 
if we look at FNAF 4, um, the Fredbear plush, right? He was the one supposedly talking to the crying child, and either there was an actual soul in there talking to him, or... I don't know, there's, there's no other option really. It has to be this, the fact that two bodies are swapped. Um, what this means for the story though, I don't know. Let's carry on and see what he says. His sister and his parents was Alec. It was the same rumpled t-shirt he'd thrown on that morning before the party. The same ripped jeans. The same unruly golden curls. His light green eyes. Hey, Alex said, a voice in his head quiet at first, but quickly it was screaming. Hey, that's not me! That's not me! His eyes, his stolen green eyes and his stolen body gleamed at Alex. And then... Fake Alex smiled. As Alex oh, trapped fish. in the lonely Freddy was carried away by a store employee, he saw fake Alec wink at him from the table before returning his attention to a smiling, happy family. Dark, right? And Alec oh isn't God. alone. After he's puked on by one of the kids at the party, he's picked up and thrown into the dumpster <laughs> where he meets a couple new friends. One final quote. His fall was broken by dozens of plush bears that looked exactly like him. Dozens of discarded low oh, friends. Cheers. Alec thought he heard himself say, pretty soon it was every bear in the bin, their thin, muted screams for help swallowed by the metal and darkness that entombed them. Alec and his new friends, dozens of the lonely ones. Ah, what? That is creepy. That is so... you don't understand. <laughs> I'm shivering. I'm actually shivering. That's so creepy. Oh my god. Maybe it, it even reinforces the idea of um, the FNAF VR where you are transferring your body through a game. I know it's not the same thing, but it's kind of um, just transferring... It's like Maui from Moana. You're, tran you're bo shape-shifting or body-shifting um, into a new body, um, and I think this is what this is dem demonstrating can happen here, as, and as Matt said before, um, these stories are giving us new concepts to work with in the game's continuity. Um, so that is something to think about. Let's see what he says about this. What a great closing line for that story! It is so heartbreaking to see this misguided kid suddenly learn to love his family, only to have his chance at redemption ripped away by these animatronics. It is so, so sad as a story. This, to me, is right in alignment with what we've been expecting from Vanny in the new FNAF game that's slated oh. to release later this year. Remember, in FNAF VR, we hear the story of Jeremy, and how he cuts off his own face in an attempt to reject the system, taking Yeah, and you get the plushie at the end. And when we the beat Vanny. that game, it ends with Glitch Trap based basically locking us away and taking over our body. We let him escape through us. But what we thought was happening on a small scale, yeah. one person yeah. getting taken over in one game, instead appears to be happening to kids in pizzerias everywhere. It's further evidence supporting this theory that I did on FNAF VR, where the story from this point forward is basically Afton creating an army, a cult, a bunch of brainwashed, or more accurately, body-swapped people hiding... Okay, so I was kind of right. The fact that he's that in the story there's multiple lonely Freddies, as you call it, in the in the dumpster, means that there's multiple bodies in human civilization that's been taken over by this by this new force, uh, and it's creating an army, as you say, of this this new force, um, and it kind of draws a parallel there to the games where the glitch trap is in all of these different bodies, it's going to create an army and it's going <laughs> to cause a war, I guess. I'm so excited for the new game, by the way. Hiding in plain sight, taking over bodies one by one. Kinda makes you wonder what FNAF 2020's got up its sleeve, right? But before we look forward... It's, it's also like the coronavirus. Forward. You see, there's one last topic I'd like to explore with this final story, but it's a doozy. It's the parallels that this story has with FNAF 4. In fact, I believe that the Lonely Freddy story is helping us I got to it solve him. what is one of the longest standing mysteries in this franchise, and also one of the strangest inclusions that we've never really mm -hmm. had a solid 
answer He's for there, it to begin he... with. And oh, that, God, my friends, it is the true story of Psychic Friend Fredbear. He's here, yes! he's there, he's everywhere. Who, Who you gonna, gonna call? call Psychic, Psychic Friend, Friend Fredbear. Fred Bear. But in order to tell you why, I'm gonna need a bit more time. So until then, my friends, there's only one last thing to say. Do you want to save money on pizza? Yeah, that's right. All this Freddy Fazbear talk has gotten me hungry for a nice old slice of pizza. I think that's it. Luckily, restaurants and food delivery are considered to be essential business. Damn it! Damn it, you really gonna... Oh. Well, I think I was right. Um, there's obviously more to it, though. Um, it, but it does draw parallels to Fredbear, in that sense. Anyway, I think I'm going to leave it there. That's a good episode. Um, it's a good kind of basis on this, on this new book. Um, hopefully he'll upload the next one next week. So um, stick around for that one. Um, and hopefully we'll get more information on what he means on this topic. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for watching, and if you liked what you see, please do make sure you subscribe, you like, and you, uh, share it with your friends. Why don't you do that? Why don't you share it on a Discord server that you like or something? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I guess that's it. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.